So you sound like it's going to change distributions. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up a second Red Hat Summit follow up from what our engineering guys, the two German guys, brought up, and I will show you how Red Hat views that this is going to change the world. And, and it, it blew my mind honestly because I just the whole idea of Solaris zones and virtualization they never really came fully to fruition, and I think this can actually do it. Like I've never seen a project take off this fast and this furious. So within four or five months, this has gotten so crazy. And the fact that it integrates so well with the OS, I do think it's going to change things. I think the way we view the OS is going to be completely different. I think you'll view the OS as capacity, and you'll view the containers as your actual workloads. And so I do think it's going to change it. Does this have any impact on Microsoft and Windows? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I hope so. Always. Always. I hope so in a negative way. Um, that's why I that. I know, that's Schadenfreude. I shouldn't do that, that's bad. You guys know what Schadenfreude is? Something German people do, we hate on everyone. We wish other people bad luck because we're not succeeding ourselves. So, that's Schadenfreude. Join the misery. You learned multiple things. Yeah, exactly. Misery. Join the misery. Well. Join the misery. Well. <laughs> I think Pearl developers have Schadenfreude. <laughs> I do. I do. But, uh, Python people don't really, they're kind of nice. But, uh, so, oh, God. I don't know what that means. That's just me thinking out loud. Um, so, so, another one thing is, more beer. yeah, beer. I need a few more. Have you considered stand-up? Um, so, one of the other interesting things, so, so these are kind of external things. I didn't bring these up at first just because I, I think it's too much. There's so many chicken and egg problems when you start talking about Docker. You're like, well, what about this? Well, what about this? How does that link to this? So, another interesting thing that happens is, so I explained to you how you would create a, a, a a child image from the base image, basically. You would, you know, fire up a Docker, you know, run bash, log into it, start changing stuff, save it, exit, commit that image back. That's cool, right? But you have no idea what's in it. Again, you kind of don't know. You can do a diff and actually see what's in it, but you still don't know how it got there. These Docker files are actually blueprints, which are actually really simple blueprints. They have like a few directives. And they basically say, run this, run this, run this. Every time it runs it, it actually saves it as a new layer. And so, completely blueprinted layers. So again, kind of, uh, what it does, doesn't necessarily get rid of Puppet, but it gets you a really nice base starting point that you is very well known. So you know, we would always struggle before. You'd have kickstarts, or do you have a, a template that you deploy from VMware, or do you, the one that I've gotten to, actually, that I see most people doing now is you, you, you kickstart a box, save that as a template, so now that template's blueprinted, then you deploy from templates and run Puppet modules to get it to like the final number state. That's pretty convoluted, honestly. So the cool part is now we'll have these sort of, you'll have a build phase where maybe you build these things with the Docker blueprints, get them to like a known good starting point, and then as you fire them up, one of the first things they'll do is call off the puppet and just configure themselves to whatever the final state is. So it, it definitely changes the way you kind of think about core builds and what they mean. And I think that's important because I think in the future, core builds won't be core builds anymore. They'll be products that you sell to your internal customers. Like when you think about what Amazon does, they have, Amazon Linux, and they sell you that Amazon Linux. And you log in on July 1st, and it's like one version of Amazon Linux. You log in in December, and it's a completely different version of Amazon Linux. It was, you know, and you can build core builds off that, but you're constantly trying to, there's no guarantee of what that is any given day. So there's a strong desire for people to build their own images, control them, and say, hey, like, to my internal team, I'm going to support this for like three years. And so when you get to that place where I just have a Docker file, I have a known good starting point with six from, say, like a Red Hat Enterprise Linux or an Ubuntu because they release a version of Ubuntu or a version of RHEL, and you know what that known starting point is. Like when you install from the ISO, you know what that is. Then you take that, you ship it into a Docker file, you know, and then pump it through some other things, get it to like sort of a base image, and then every time you deploy from that, you then you call your puppet. Or, or some people will bake some of it into the Docker image too. You know, that's another thing. Since they're Docker files, you could automate the builds of all those things and have them like rebuild every night or have them rebuild in Jenkins, just like it, you do code. So it really takes those images and turns them more into an actual thing that you build as opposed to like a thing that you bake, then change, and then hopefully save it, and then hopefully remember what you did to it later. You know, you, it really is completely a buildable thing. You could start now thinking about those images as, so, you know, the images are the program and the source code is the Docker file, you know, and, and you know, which starts from a known good starting point with an ISO or something like that. And uh, I'll give you an example, like, so, so a very, very basic Docker file, you would pull it from like a, a certified RHEL image, for example, or a certified CentOS image, which actually comes from Docker. They, they have a standard CentOS one that they support. Now, mind you, there's no SLA around it. They might change it every other day, which is the danger of this. So that's why you still want to start with a known good starting point, like a RHEL 6 or a Ubuntu 11 or whatever. You want like an exact version of an OS um, because you need some kind of version there at the very beginning. 
And then what you would do is you like when you fire up the Docker image, you do like a yum update or an apt get, and you just update the thing to the latest greatest. Then you run some other things, and you're like, okay, cool. This image is always at like exactly what I want. It was built on June 13th, and that's the June 13th image. And I know how to, exactly how to get to a June 13th image. So it kind of helps you get to a really good known starting point. Um, and then once you've built those things, one of the interesting things about Docker is it also has a registry infrastructure. The whole, they had thought through this pretty well when they started coming up with it. They, you, when you see these images, they get saved locally in what's called an index. And then there's a remote index called a registry. The remote index is what Docker Inc. hosts. So they've already kind of started another side business of hosting these things. So kind of like GitHub for images, if you will. So you pay them to have a private little space in there that you push your own custom images into. And so it's nominal cost, you know, but you can have a little team, they can all log in, there's role-based access controls, you can have administrators, you can have users, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and so it's kind of interesting. It's like GitHub hosting for images. And you can push these images out there. They also give you that same piece of software. It's also open source. I think it's Python. But again, I don't know because I didn't care because I deployed it as a Docker image. So I just ran a command and it was on port 5000. I pushed stuff to it. I didn't care. So it's really weird because you don't even care what language it was written in. You don't really care what OS is running in. As long as it runs and it's like kind of runs well on whatever kernel I have, that's all I really care about. Um, and then even now, um, Quay.io is already, there's already a competitor to, to Docker Inc. in like five months. So four months. I don't know. I don't know the backstory of Quay.io, but they're private registry for end users. So it's like GitHub's competitor for Docker images is already there early on in this thing. So I mean, and they're both they are both probably technologically are at about the same place. So that's pretty funny to me. The fact that there's already an ecosystem forming around competing for for hosting these images, um, and I think it's a good sign. And then of course RHEL 7, which nobody expected to be probably as tightly embraced with Docker. At least I didn't. Um, because it was already so late in the development cycle, I figured we wouldn't, but we, we, we can get off our butt and really hammer down when we see something that's like really world changing. So we, we got it into RHEL 7. I mean, release candidates out now, and, uh, and a ton of Red Hat some of us <coughs> about it. So index.docker.io. Yeah, index.docker.io. You can go to Docker.io and run Docker in a window. They'll spin up a little instance for you and let you. Oh, really? I didn't start. see that. Yeah. I'll show you locally. I have it running. And then, so, so easy one, this is how you run a Docker image. So Father Linux means that, so when it sees this with nothing in front of it, it knows that's on the publicly hosted Docker.io, you know, index.docker.io.com. This is my username, Father Linux. So if any of you guys have used Windows today, you can, you can confess to me. I'll be in a box <laughs> on the back, and then I'll like, describe to you like, documentation and kernel patches and things like that that you have to do in for like, patents. But, uh, so you run docker run, dash i means interactive, dash t means run it in a terminal, dash rm means remove that. So, so as I mentioned, every time you fire a docker container, it actually creates a branch from the base image, and it leaves that disk, that branch disk image on disk. With a dash rm, it just blows it away, so it's completely transient. So one, one side effect is when you keep running these things all the time, you end up with all these freaking images on your disk. So I use the dash rm all the time for anything that I don't, I'm literally just logging into it. To mess around, and I don't care. And then you can see the final thing. You know, this is CentOS base. You know, six base. These are just images that I created that are on Docker.io that I've created. I've created CentOS four, five, and six just so people could play and test this. And then um, you know, you run Bash. That's that's. You always give it the one process that has to start up inside of that container. So if you want it to feel like an, a, a VM, you just start Bash, and then you can do all kinds of other stuff from there. You can you know run init scripts and run things and fire them up. Now you can imagine down the road the certified rel images will probably run system D by default, and so they will start up just like an OS, and so they'll run whatever the heck they're supposed to run. <coughs> so that will be an interesting change that will be coming down the road. So, so how do I use Docker? So the simplest thing is install user space tools from the EPL. It's really like three, four commands. I have it in a blog entry. I'll show it to you. Uh, pull images from the public registry and then just run something. And I'll show you how easy this is to do. <coughs> So, um, caveats. So, device mapper driver is new. I have found scenarios where it like won't delete an image. Like I fire one up and I do that dash rm and I kill the Docker image and it just just doesn't die and I can't delete it. And I don't fully understand how to mess around with the lightweight container, the lightweight uh, snapshots in LVM to actually delete the right one. So. <laughs> So I'm kind of still a little hairy. Um, I've had random ones where like I fire up a container and just can't connect to the internet, and I'm like, don't know why that's not working. And then I'll shut it down, delete it, and then start another one. It just works. Or I've had to sometimes restart Docker, so sometimes it gets mucked up, and I don't know what it's doing exactly. Maybe it's not creating the right 
the right NAT rules in IP tables or something. Uh, you know, the other the other caveat is complicated software like Satellite Six, which runs like 17 different demons, you know, to get it to all work as one application. I don't think it's that many, but it's a lot. You you know, you have to kind of, without somebody providing that for you, that's going to be hairy until System D is fully supported inside of the Docker image. Once System D is fully supported, then anybody that writes software inside of you know that works on RHEL will just fire up and work right, just like it would normally within RHEL or Fedora or Ubuntu. Same thing, you know, anything. I don't. What is theirs now? Upstart? Are they still staying with Upstart? They switched to System D. Did they switch to System D? I, I, yeah. I think so. I didn't hear that. Go okay, that's actually pretty big yeah. news. Yeah. And yeah, so now your your whole your whole you know boycott System D is going to fall apart now. Life's over. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with Amazon Linux. Yeah. They're, they're just a rebuild of RHEL, so you're dead. Yeah, I'll yeah. stay with the old version. <laughs> but how long will they support it? Support it myself. Ask I'll support Ask it myself. How? I have Mike. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, here's, I, well, here, I, I'll go back to this. I'll be nice to you guys. Do you have any questions? Anyone yet? I've got a question. All right, go ahead. Do you know how, like, have you looked at the system D tools for managing, like, LXD containers? Um, I have not dug into it deeply yet, but I'll tell you there's a ton of work going on in there. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that like relates to Docker, or, like, because it seems oh, it's very similar, and I don't it's know. It's huge, and I can tell you what the high-level architecture is, but I haven't dug deeply into actually messing with it myself, just because it's pretty raw, and I yeah. kind of just want to wait for them to figure out what they want to do, and then I'll do it once it's working the right way. Well, it seems like every announcement is always just like a ton of new stuff on containers. Yeah. So. From, from the high level, I can tell you Gear D. Have you heard of Gear D? No. So, Gear or Gear D um, will be the network version of System D that kind of controls everything. It will also be what what can take operating systems, turn them into images, and do all kinds of magical stuff. Take, I think there's some idea that it will help take applications and turn them into Docker containers. And it will also be what fires up these Docker containers or what talks to the local System D on all the different host nodes and then tells them what to fire up. Because you remember, when you fire up a container inside of System D, you want to tell it, keep restarting that thing every time it dies. So System D has some interesting features. The, the most interesting to me with containers is, you know, init scripts like don't really know when something dies. I mean, you could, you could possibly build a cron job that sits there and checks all the time, and if, something, if it runs status and it's dead, restart it. You could do that, but that's not built into the regular init scripts. System D is smart enough to do that, and it's actually aware of that. The, the UID of the and, and the process ID of the of the process that it started, so it can actually wait. And if it finds out it died, it can restart instantly. You can imagine that's way better than any other clustering software we've ever had. So so if it sees that process hanging some way, and you can build like more sophisticated checks on that. So if a container hangs, it can restart that container instantly. That's the dream state of that. Is when system these underneath the Docker images, and one of them hangs or acts weird, it restarts it. It takes like 200 milliseconds. So that's pretty cool. That's way cooler than rebooting an OS when it decides to act crazy, or or you know restarting the entire. Now, mind you, you still have to wait if there's a Java container in there. You're going to wait whatever the hell it takes to start Java. But but I mean Python and Apache or Nginx pretty fast. I mean you know it's going to be like sub two seconds. It's back on. Oh wait, my browser didn't even time out. That's pretty good actually. I mean that's way better than anything we have now. Are you saying System D is a System Dogger? Docker. No, System D is doesn't stand for Docker, but System D, I don't know what the, I think they just added D because adding D things are cool. D or E, there's a reason why those sign languages. Yeah, yeah, system D. Yeah, System D. But why is it called Gear D? Gear Demon, I guess. I don't know. Everything has a D on the end nowadays. Okay, so I call myself Scott D. Yeah, A B C D. Yeah, D. Okay. Yeah, D is in dog. Thank you. That's Mike D. Chad D. Gary D. Ryan G D. Yeah, G D. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> weird. Though. I want to do that. To you. All right. <laughs> Alright, I'll say the whole name, but another question. Another question here. Alright. With uh, SE Linux, you said they're going to be incorporating this with uh, Docker. Is yes. that going to be right out of the box on Red Hat 7, or is there going to yes. be... Okay. That will be out of the box. The okay. whole, so we're doing a ton of work to make SE Linux. A ton of what we've done with KVM. So, so I think it wasn't as obvious to people of how much work we've done in KVM to make it work within C groups and SE Linux. So like Red Hat Enterprise has been a virtual... Oh, excuse me. Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization use a t uses a ton of SE Linux rules and, and C group rules to, to c control virtual machines. And we're kind of implementing that exact same logic with the Docker containers. Yeah, I'm just worried that somebody's going to spin up an old version of Apache on a container and then the whole system gets compromised okay. or something like that. So far, and admittedly, even again six months ago, if you read, people were like, ah, containers aren't good enough. Now, with, I think what people are seeing with the PAM namespace with C groups with SE Linux, it's 
I mean, it'll be like Black Hat this year, right? Like somebody will try and hack out of their way out of a, you know, system D container, or I mean, a Docker container. We'll see, or an LXC container. We'll see what happens. Yeah. But the cool part is, Docker doesn't care what the container technology is underneath it. It can use other things. So if we figure out something better, or we need to patch it in some way, it should be able to, you know, cope with it. What kind of concert, uh, security uh, is implemented with uh, Docker? So. Inside of Docker, you can implement SE Linux again to start System D, and then let System D can start. <coughs> System D can only start and stop what what it should be able to start and stop. You know that kind of thing. And then underlying, it's similar to like I said, KVM, where where those different containers have their own rules. So they might not even be able to talk to each other. They might not even be able to ping each other. You know. So there's there's a lot of control of that. Same with inside. The idea is inside. Well, inside of a container will still be like that's your place, right? You wouldn't want to slice that up any further. That's no, at least not today. Do you understand the granularity of SE Linux? Do I understand it? Yeah, it's very granular. I know. And the idea is that hopefully whatever distribution you have provides you with the very same things that just kind of work out of the box. And good tools to, to troubleshoot it. So there are always like audit to whatever, and I forget what the other one is, repair to or something. There's two commands in Red Hat that you can use to fix SE Linux pretty actually easily and turn it into like a module that you can just dump into the SE SC Linux. Which most people again don't know about that. Even I'm not that deep into it because I don't like I don't I don't security interested me in like ten years ago now I just want to get stuff done and where let other security people worry about that stuff. <laughs> like make it so it's not hackable. <laughs> I'm already off doing something else. <laughs> but uh specialization. Uh, specialization. <laughs> when I, back when I was in my NASA days I could have like cited you all the rules of ITAR data and been like this is my now I realize that security people just slow me down. I'm just like, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I am kidding. All right. So you're in the middle. <laughs> I am in the middle, admittedly. Don't get me wrong. Target sees the value of security right now. <laughs> so either way. So you know it'll make your life easier, right? I mean, you're a, you're a developer, sysadmin, architect, consultant. I mean, anybody that needs to do stuff quickly and test things, I mean, this is awesome. Like, honestly, even if you're in Ubuntu and you need to run a rel image, for the most part, it might not be certified to work, but it does work. Like, I've already played around. I've ran Ubuntu inside of rel 6, and it looks fine. I mean, I didn't run, like, a web server for 30 days to see if it, like, crashes somehow down the road. But, I mean, for quick and dirty stuff, it's awesome. Um, you know, uh, I think it's interesting that, again, the, kind of the, uh, the, the ecosystem that's forming around it, the fact that Red Hat has gotten behind it so hot and heavy so quick, the fact that Quay.io is already a competitor, like GitHub pretty much ran out. Nobody was competing with them for like a year or something. Right. You know, so they, they got a lockdown on that. And there's competitors now, but I can't name any of them. I mean, no, no, no. yeah, who cares? What? Yeah, but whatever, they failed. <laughs> so nobody cares about them anymore. <laughs> Quay.io, who knows? Maybe they'll never take Docker. I don't know. Whatever. But either way, it's kind of cool that you see an ecosystem so like and then I just actually today translate. I had written an article internally at Red Hat that a bunch of tech people were using, and and I translated it to be more of a public facing thing where I kind of dig in and explain. And I actually did a ton of editing because I kind of there were a few things that I thought were really clear when I wrote it, and uh, they weren't clear. So I kind of went back and tweaked it. So I'll kind of show you guys this this guy, or I won't. The internet is off. The internet's broken. <laughs> Heartbleed, heartbleed, heartbleed. <laughs> heartbleed, somebody got it. Part two. But I'll fire up my MyFi and I'll show you guys how Docker works. Actually, here, I'll show you how Docker works locally. You got to do the Sputnik thing on the Wi Fi. Let's do this. <coughs> They're already like that. That's an error that you don't want to see. <laughs> Get rid of that. You guys didn't see that. Um, I'm on the jury and I remember that. <laughs> Strike that from the record. Is that guy that clear to you guys? All right. So uh, here, let's do this. So, like for example, you want to get into boom. Look at how fast that is. So here, let's do a time on this guy. What is it? Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Let's do it this way. <laughs> man, let's do man, man. Oh, that won't work either. Want to do cat? That's right. I need something do less. less. See, no, let's do something better than that. There, all right, 555. It's a little slow. That is kind of slow. My laptop, it's on battery, dude. What do you want? Excuse me. No, oh, wait, till, wait till this internet's back up. You wait. 
There we go. You wait. Yeah, here we go. Oh, that was 715. That example isn't good either. Come on, watch this. We can fix this. How fast do you guys want this to be? Less than 0.715. Oh, watch this. I want it already done. Right here. Let's make it 195. Oh, there you go. There, how do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good. I think it's pretty good. There, let's do that post. It's, tr it's on the internet. It's true. <laughs> it's like 195 milliseconds. It's so fast. All right, so it took 700. I should change that back before I forget what it is. What was it? Does anybody remember what that was? 700. It's in your history. Your revisions. Click on browse. All right. Yeah, you're right. I can go. Look at that. You're right. I like Gaurav. He's so good at this stuff. He's so much better at telling the truth than I am. An admitted liar. Oh, yeah, that was 715. All right, we'll just go forward. Up. You never go back. You always go forward. So now that I'm done joking around. All right, so, so well, you kind of got to see, though, I mean, how cool that is. So, oh, here's some. I did not run the dash rm command, so watch this. So docker dash ps, or docker ps, sorry. Old habits die hard. So, so you can see these guys exit above a minute ago. So it names each of them. So clever curly, drunk or condescending brown. So send that to part of the yeah. Kick ass, pear, tender point. I don't know why I said that. But either way, they thought they were clever. Or, yeah, clever. You can use the numbers. So, <coughs> numbers are so you can kind of see here, though. I mean, it, it shows you what command you ran. It shows you. Um, shows you the exit status, so you can see these guys are all done. Now, if I go over here, let me actually, let me SU this guy. And what just happened? That was correct. Um, so, uh, oh, here I go. Docker run dash i dash t, and then we'll do uh, father Linux slash CentOS. 6 dash base, and then we'll do bash. All right, so I'm in bash, right? So let's do this. Let's do a PS. So you'll see that guy's now running. You see he's up four seconds. He's up eight seconds, up nine seconds. That shows you what command it's ran. But you notice that all these guys are still laying around. So even though they're even though they're they're done, I could actually commit any one of these guys back. So if I wanted to, I could like do a commit. So if I were to like say that's in my history. So say I wanted to whatever I had done in this guy was really cool. Like say this. Um, say I wanted to Etsy to some big network, and I just want to change his host name to less than two hundred milliseconds. Dot crunch tools. Dot com. So so and I want to exit. Now that guy's saved, and you'll see if I do a PS, he's actually stopped. He's an exit. But I can commit this guy back. So I can do a Docker commit. And you guys are going to make me ruin all this. But And I hate mouse pads. And let's try that again. So I'm going to commit this guy back.